Good morning. Before I get into the message this morning, I just want to highlight something coming up this week that's very exciting and you're going to want to be a part of. And that is an event called Q Commons. And I'm sure you've heard of it over the last few weeks if we've been announcing it and pushing it and promoting it on social media. Um, you're going to want to come to this. If you are free Thursday night from 7 to 9, I encourage you to come. If you are not free but you have something that isn't a big deal to change to another night, I encourage you to do that and to come, to clear your schedule, to be with us here in this worship center on Thursday night from 7 to 9. If you cannot go, because you do have a commitment that you cannot get out of, I encourage you to ask the person next to you, would you like to go and pay for their way? Let's do our part in advancing good in our city. This is an event that's going to talk about homelessness. It's going to talk about mental health. And it's going to talk about racism. We are going to come together with people just like you and me, just, just us and other people outside of Crosspoint. And we are going to gather together, hear from some fantastic local and international speakers on these issues. This is all going to happen in two hours. Plus, there's going to be refreshments, and there's going to be, there's going to be a lot happening. It's going to be jam-packed. It's going to be fast-moving, and it's going to be transformative. So I encourage you today to register, to be here, and let's see what we can do. Let's see what can happen when a team of like-minded, good people come together to advance good, to advance what God wants to do in our cities. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, it was the month of June, and it was the year 2005. It was a Wednesday, and I woke up very early, about 5 a.m., and I had mild contractions. I was pregnant with my second baby, and it was one day before the due date. I make my way, I start to get ready. I'm like, man, this could be the day, this could be the day. I make my way downstairs in our house, and then three-year-old Josiah bounces in the room. He was a hyper child. Um, he seems very calm right now, if you know him. That was nothing like his childhood. It's scary even thinking back. He bounces in the room. He runs up to me and he holds my leg and he's hugging me. And he says, Mommy, today is going to be a very special day for baby Faith, which was our next baby. We had already named. We knew she was going to be a girl. Only he didn't say Faith. I have to tell you what he really said. He said baby face because that's what he called her at that time. He was not wrong. About eight hours later... Baby Faith came into the world. Five pounds, 13 ounces. <laughs> Just this little, little thing. She was perfect. Our best friends in the world, they were watching Josiah while we were there, and Grandma was three hours away, and she was driving like a madman to get there. Brings, they bring Josiah to the hospital, and Grandma shows up, and, and we're all there, and there's this special moment, and he's holding his little sister, and we're there, and everything is perfect. Well, the day and the afternoon goes on, and I'm getting tired, and it's getting late, and, and uh, we decide our, our company should probably go, and we should start to settle in for the evening. So they leave, and the nurse comes around the corner, and she says to Craig and I, she says, I'm just going to take little Faith, and we're going to uh, take her into another room just to check her oxygen level. It's going to be in the high 90s, and then we're just going to bring it right back. Dad, do you want to come? you want to come with? Mom, why don't you just rest and relax? It would be like 10, 15 minutes. We're like, yeah, that sounds good. I was good for a power nap by then anyway. So they leave and I just kind of turn on the lights and I settle in just for a quick nap. And then I, I wake up and it's been like 30 minutes. And uh, I lay back down again. I'm like, it's kind of strange. She said they would be right back. And I lay down again, I kind of drift in and out, and next thing you know, it's been like an hour, hour and a half, and I'm like, okay. And then, you know that feeling? 
in the pit of your stomach when something's not quite right? Yeah, that, that feeling. I'm like, I, there's something wrong. There's, they, this shouldn't be happening. I am about to figure a way to like get out of bed and go find them when Craig rushes in the room and he does not look good. He's pale, he's frantic, and he says, Renee, something is wrong. I don't know what is wrong, but something is wrong with faith. He's like, you need to come with me. So I, I get out of bed. It's, it's just, it's surreal at this moment. And, and we, we walk to this room and I, I go into this room and there's all these big machines and these tiny little beds and tons of doctors and nurses and specialists just everywhere and one little baby. And I look and she's laying on this little bed and she has all these things attached to her and, and no one's saying anything. I sit down, I, I don't know what to do. Craig doesn't know what to do. He, no one's told him anything at this point. And it's, we're in there about 45 minutes before anyone says anything. And then someone comes over to us and they say, your baby's oxygen level is really low. Um, in fact, it's so low, she should have been very, very blue. It was in the 50s. If anyone knows anything about auction levels, that's really bad. It's in the 50s. It should have been in the high 90s. We actually thought the machine was broken, so we tried a new machine, and it read the same thing. We thought, well, maybe that one's wrong too, and so we tried another one, but they're all reading the same thing. So we have a cardiologist coming in right now. They're going to check her out, but it's probably something to do with her heart. We don't know what at this point. That was a lot to take. And then they pulled out a Polaroid camera. And they held that camera up and they took two pictures of faith. And then they handed us these two blurry pictures. They didn't say anything, but we knew why. We knew it was a just-in-case picture, just in case she didn't make it through the night. This nightmare just invaded our dream. Within the next few hours, our little five-pounder was rushed to the children's hospital in the city. I took the liberty of discharging myself from the hospital so we could go and be with her. This June 29th day, whirlwind of a day, launched us as a family and friends and future family and friends into this incredible, faith-filled, mountaintop, valley type of journey that triggered this, this, this form of fast and slow place contending in the continual position of contention. 13 years of fighting and resting. 13 years of pushing on the enemy and pulling on God. Faithful believing and situational doubting. Anyone else relate to this type of journey? I know I'm not the only one. Our baby, Faith, was diagnosed with a complex heart defect, many of you know this, that would take medical science by surprise. In fact, they wrote a medical journal on her heart because it had not yet been seen up to that point. Today, 13 years later, she's still surprising them, just in a different way. God has been so faithful in this journey. See, in this life, not everything comes easy. Or you're like, well, thank you for, you know, the most obvious statement of the day and or year. When we have illness or disease or sickness or in injury that takes on us or takes us on a process of pain and then the days turn into weeks and the weeks to months and months to years, it is difficult to stay in a position of belief. It's much easier to settle into a life of struggle, 
just to accept it. Well, this is just my life. Just to work towards being at mental and emotional peace. Just to, I'm just going to accept this journey with my physical struggle. This just is what it is. It is the way it is. That's easier than waking up every morning and believing for healing. Because when you settle into a life of struggle, you become at peace mentally and emotionally with it. You don't have to worry about disappointment. You have nothing to be disappointed about. You're not hoping in anything. You've accepted it. We had a choice back then. And we said, if we don't believe for faith, who will? So we took on that risk and that challenge of disappointment, knowing that that was her only hope. It is not the Father's heart for us to accept our struggles as a means of this is, is what it is. Yes, he wants to be us at peace, but no to the struggle and the sickness. James 1.17 says, Every gift God freely gives us is good and perfect, streaming down from the Father of lights who shines from the heavens with no hidden shadow or darkness that is never subject to change. So let me ask you this. Is sickness good? No. Then it's not from God. Because every gift God freely gives us is good. So if your sickness isn't good or perfect, then it's not from God. So the theology that maybe you have that says that God gave you a sickness or gave someone a sickness in order to teach you something, you can just go ahead and throw that out. Because it sounds super spiritual, but it's not very biblical. At 17 years old, right before I entered, I was about to enter Bible college, and I was about to cross the country to go there, my mom gave me this piece of advice that I have never forgotten. She said, Renee, be courageous enough to accept the truth, even if it's different from what you've always heard. She said, my father told me this, and now I'm passing it on to you. This from the lady who taught me everything I knew about God. At 44 years old, she was still teachable and moldable and trainable, knowing that, hey, if I was wrong on some things and I passed it on to you and now you're wrong, be courageous, be brave enough to accept the truth, even if it's different from what you've ever always believed or heard. So my encouragement this morning is for us in this room to be brave enough, to open our heart enough, to open our spirit enough to accept truth, even if it's different from what you've always heard. Healing comes from God. Sickness entered the world the same time as sin, at the fall of man. When Eve took the bait of Satan and Adam took the bait of Eve. Therefore, God does not cause sickness, he did not create sickness, and he does not impose sickness on us. Sickness has not been created. Sickness is an imperfection in the creation. Sickness and death were not a part of the original plan. The original plan was health and wholeness. The original plan was love and perfection of the Father. The original plan was joy and fullness of life. And healing is ours. And Craig talked about this last week. He talked about how God just doesn't heal. He is healer. And, and he resides within us. So if he resides within us and he is healer, then healing actually is already in us. So it couldn't be more accessible than what it already is. It is literally in us, and we just have to believe it and take a hold of it and receive it by faith. So you're like, well, that's, that's great, Renee. Thanks for telling me that. But what do I do when healing doesn't happen? Those early days of believing for faith to be healed were up and down. To say it mildly, one day things were going really, really well and we could see progress and things are happening. The next day, it, it's like we went back two weeks. We didn't have the luxury 
of knowing about today. Like back then, 13 years ago, I, didn't, I couldn't see faith today. I didn't know what was going to happen. I, I, I didn't have the luxury of seeing the future and know, oh, okay, that's fine. Well, she's going to be fine, so I can just relax. All I knew was what was in front of me and what the word said and what I tried to believe. So when you're going through situations like we go through in this life, when we're believing for something and we're not seeing it, what, what, what do we do? How do we deal with that? What if we lose her? What if it doesn't happen? What if the healing doesn't work? What if the prayer doesn't go through? What, what, what if we believe and believe and believe and then we still end up back worse than we had thought? In the Bible, there's so many examples of, of the, the people who believed in faith and walked on these incredible journeys, like Abraham, who was told that he was going to be father of nations, but yet went on and on and on and on for years, watching his body age, watching his wife be barren, not even capable of having children. All the while watching his friends and family you know, get married, have babies, raise a family, get married, have babies, have a family. Like, he, did, he watched it. Those are things we don't think about. How he watched it. Do you, you know what it's like when you're going through something and something that you're needing happens to someone else? You guys know what that feels like, right? Where you're like, man, I really, I'm, I'm, I'm believing for this financial breakthrough. And then, oh, they got a financial breakthrough. I really need this financial breakthrough. It's so hard. And that was Abraham. He just watched all these people have babies and raise families and all that. I'm so supposed to be the father of many nations and it's not happening for me nothing the agony then there's the woman with the issue of blood Luke chapter 8 verse 43 12 years of trying everything out there she had exhausted all of her finances she had tried every doctor under the sun nothing was working and then she hears about this man named Jesus who's healing people who's setting people free she finds out where he is and she goes to the crowd there's people everywhere. And she begins to push through. Do you know how uncomfortable this must have been for her? She's bleeding for 12 years and currently in this situation as she is trying to get through the crowd. And that crowd, yeah, they probably know her. They probably know her story. Oh, that's that lady that's been leaving for 12 years. She's tried everything. What makes her think today is going to be day? You know what? I need something from Jesus today. I'm here and I have my own issues and she's trying to push through the crowd, but I'm trying to push through the crowd too. So what makes her think that today's going to be any different from her? I need something. What, what is she doing? But yet, what was in her that had such a resilience to get through that crowd believing today could be my day? What about the, the cripple? They call them at the pool of Bethesda. In John chapter 5, it said hundreds of sick people were lying on the porches, the paralyzed, the blind, and the crippled, all waiting for their healing. Picture it, hundreds of cripples, of blind. I mean, if, if I saw that today, I would be, I don't even know. That would be unreal, an unreal sight to see. The desperation, the pain, the agony. And they're just waiting to be healed. They're waiting for the angel of God, it says, who would periodically descend. It's just like they're waiting, waiting. Like, and then stir the waters. And when the water was, was stirred, there would be a mad rush for everyone. All these crippled, the blind, like... I can't even imagine this sight of we're all trying to get through. And a lot of them have help because they can't get there on their own. So they have their people, their family who are there, and they're just waiting. If you've ever been waiting to get to a concert or you're waiting to get that seat because it's, you don't have your own seat and it's like rush seating, and you're just waiting. I've done that. I'm always the one chosen because I'm always the smallest, and they're like, you can run the fastest, you can get through the crowd. So when we're all, it's always me. And I'm like, man, it's so much pressure. Anyway, so they're just there, and they're waiting, and then they, the, the angel, and then stirring the waters, and then they grab their people, and they're rushing, rushing. And this man, this cripple, 38 years, he sat by this pool, waiting. And then Jesus shows up one day. 
And he sees him lying there, and he, you know, he knows. And then he says, do, do you truly want to be healed? And the man says, sir, there's no way. Like, I want to, but I have no one with me to lower me into the water. So when the angel comes, I just, I can't make it. Someone always jumps ahead of me. And then Jesus says to him, stand up, pick up your sleeping mat and walk. And immediately he was healed. See, day after day, he was waiting for a moment only to get cut off by someone faster, someone better. Watching all those years, people receive their miracle, the miracle he needed, and he never got it. See, he believed he could, that God could heal him through this way. But will he? do it. Will I make it? Will it happen for me? I know he's capable, but I just don't know if it's going to happen for me. See, that's the mind games we play with ourselves. Why would it work this time? How, how is this prayer any different? How is this Sunday different? How is this situation any better? See, what makes today different is the definition of today in and of itself. It's today. It's not yesterday. It's a new day. So that is what makes today different. The definition of today is today. It's something different than what it was before. See, our present reality isn't contingent on our past experiences. It's a new day. It's new possibilities. The Bible says his mercies are new every morning. I interviewed Faith, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. I was going to have her up here. Ironically enough, she's really struggling with a cough things this morning. And, and a, lot of, a lot of people are. I, there's, there's a lot of people which we're going to get there. Today is Healing Sunday, so I'm just declaring that. But... I interviewed Faith and asked some questions, and I'm just, I just want you to have a little sneak peek into her journey. I asked her how old she was, which I clearly knew. She's 13. I asked her, Faith, when, would you, when did you know, or when, when did your heart defect start at birth? Then I asked her, at what point or age did you come to understand that your journey had unique challenges that many other people didn't have? She said when she was about eight or nine years old is when she realized, huh, it's different for me. Then I asked her, when was it the hardest in these past 13 years? And she talked about having to eat differently when she was diagnosed with protein loss. Um, at five years old, she was diagnosed with protein loss due to a rare side effect of a surgery that she had. And when she would eat any foods that were high in fats, uh, protein would just rush out of her body and it's very dangerous. So she had to eat very, very high protein. And one of those things that she had to have every morning was a protein shake. This might not seem like a big deal to you guys, but this was really hard for her. Every morning she had to have these shakes and all these proteins and she wasn't allowed. She'd go to birthday parties, no cake, no cookies, no ice cream, no school, no chocolate, no candy bars. It, it, she just didn't get to experience those things. She said that was the hardest day after day facing that. I said, when was it the easiest? She said the first time I went to heart camp. Which was two years ago first time. She said, because the first time of my life, I got to see people just like me. And I said, Faith, how do you deal with the emotional struggle and your thoughts, just like your mind in your journey? She said, I would think about how me and Jesus we're in this together. So whatever I'm going through, it's not just me. He's going through it too. So it's just not me not 
being able to eat these foods. But it's Jesus too. He's with me. I said, what, what was your lowest point in your journey? She said, my lowest point in my journey was a couple years ago when I really believed I wouldn't have to have a pacemaker. I was believing for healing that I wouldn't have to have that surgery, but I had to have it anyway. I said, well, what, what was your highest point in your journey? She said, my highest point was when I was healed from my protein loss and I was back to normal eating, which I'm sure you guys remember that. And then I said, why don't, just tell me for a minute how you really feel, like some real emotions so that people can kind of get, and my heart in sharing this is because I know you guys are on similar journeys and you know people on journeys like this. She said, there's been times in the past where I felt angry or upset that I didn't get a childhood like my friend's. But she said then there was like perks along the way. Like when I was five and I got out of the hospital just days before Christmas Day. And I walked into my church and as I walked in, it was the last song of the service and they were singing Happy Day. (laughs) You guys remember that song? Oh, Happy Day. And we walked right up to the front and there was not a dry eye in the church. And then she said, but I'm past all that anger now because today I just have to take medicine. But that's all I've ever known because I don't remember a time when I didn't do that. And I said, Faith, what is one thing, if you were to speak to someone who encouraged someone who is listening or here this morning, and they're contending for something in their life. They're, they've been walking through a difficult journey for a long time, and they're contending for healing, but they haven't seen it yet, what would you say to them? She said, well, everyone says this, but actually keep praying, keep believing, keep talking to God. Even on your worst day, you don't have to beg him, just keep talking to him about your day, what's happening, hang out together, watch Netflix together. She said, God works outside of time. For me, my healing from this diet took seven years. It was a long time to wait, but it happened. See, contending in contention is good, but hope in healing is better. Then I said, Faith, talk about how you found hope in your healing. And she said, I focused on the little victories. I would get my protein tested and, oh, it was up a little bit. It wasn't normal yet, but it was up today. She said, those were signs that God was working. God is love. He is patience. He is hope. God is always with us. So we always have hope. Always. And that was her interview. See, Proverbs 13, verse 12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. See, the sickness or the illness that you have or that you're battling with, the journey that you've been on, has to bow its knee to life as hope restored gives way to your dream. You are not alone. We are family, and no one expects you to walk your journey alone. We don't expect you to, and you shouldn't expect yourself to. Sometimes we're so hard on ourselves, and we just isolate ourselves, and we just want to walk this out, and we're like, well, just, I'll just do it over here. I don't want to bother anyone. I don't want to be the downer. I don't want to be the focus of attention, but that is not how we were placed, and we were placed in family so we can walk out a journey together. Families live together. Families struggle together. Families contend together, lose together, 
fight, win, and rest together. This morning, we are going to do some family time and we're going to do some ministry because I believe that the, the Lord is present to heal today. Before we, we do that, so if you're here and, and you have an illness, a sickness, something you've been battling with a long time and you've just been contending in the middle of contention, of strife, of pain, of difficulty for so many years, then I believe today the Father has something for you. If you just have something new that just came on this week, I believe the Father has something for you. Okay, no one is excluded and everyone's included this morning. But before we go into this, I want to share a few stories, a few testimonies of healing just to, the Bible says that faith comes from my hearing, hearing the word. And we've shared some word this morning and we'll continue. And I'm going to share some testimonies of God and how he has worked through our lives. And we've seen miracles so that you can just be a little elevated in your faith this morning. I used to wear glasses. I don't anymore. <laughs> anyway, no. So, yeah, I mean, I was just in a service one day, and the, they were like, is anyone here wear glasses? And you just want prayer for your eyes? And I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, sure, why not? Hadn't thought about it before. And I went up, and they prayed for me, and then I, I actually had a eye appointment like the next week just to check my eyes just at one of those things and they're like wow you're at you 20 20 vision you're like perfect well it's weird why do you have glasses I'm like I was healed so I don't wear glasses so that happened so long ago I forget to tell that story all the time anyway um Josiah when he was a baby uh you know that uh, how the tear ducts are supposed to open up on their own uh, with babies, maybe you don't know that, but they're supposed to, and then that's how we cry and have tears. Well, one of his didn't open, and uh, he was scheduled for surgery to have the, that open. And the thing is, it's a very simple procedure where they just kind of take this little sharp object and point it towards the eye. doesn't sound so simple now that I'm saying it out loud. But, uh, but they actually have to put babies asleep because, you know, they move and stuff. So we were like, oh, man, you know, that kind of sucks. So we brought him up to our pastor at the time and very simple church was over and just laid hands on him and just pray that it would be open and uh boom it opened up and canceled the surgery and they're like why are you canceling the surgery you've been waiting for the surgery for a while we're like well god healed his eye so we don't need it when we were at our church in canada um we had a service one night we'd have them every so often on sunday nights and um the a blind man walked in um, with his cane and his wife, and uh, legally blind, couldn't drive anything like that, and he could just see kind of like a little tiny bit enough to, you know, move, but like he was legally blind, and uh, we prayed over him, and his eyes opened, eyes open, blind eyes open, just like that, like, what's that? He got his driver's license, like he was, this was a legitimate miracle, like blind man, now fully seen man. Right, just right there. This happened. We were like, I, we weren't even praying for him. Someone else was. Uh, we were running the service or something and we just worship. And uh, some of the church people were just like, you know, in this little huddle praying around this blind man. And uh, next thing we know, they're like, woo! And we're like, oh, I wonder what's happening over there. And uh, yeah, he opened his eyes. When I was in middle school, we went away to a camp. And it was like a youth camp. And there's this girl a couple years younger than me, and she had uh, those crutches. I don't know what they're called. Uh, forgive me, but uh, it's where your arms let go, go in them, and you hold. And, and this was her life since birth. And um, she was now like adolescent age. And we went to camp, and they were having like a healing night. And she went up, and, and um, they prayed over her. And she threw her crutches down and began to walk on her own for the first time in her life amazing her parents jumped in that car they flew five hours and they could I mean this was radical radical um what else I mean there's so many I, another uh incident when we were uh, pastoring in Canada a 
a couple years back, there's this lady, uh, uh, not a Christian family, didn't, didn't know Jesus, but their nanny was our children's pastor. And uh, so she would she do the children's pastor thing, and then she nannied, and, and she was just always telling this lady and her family about Jesus. And she's like, you know, God can heal you, because with it, the situation was she had a heart condition that would make her tire uh, quickly. So she couldn't actually take care of her children. She couldn't even, like, sometimes get out of bed in the morning just to get them ready for school. It was very, very bad. And she couldn't walk, go on walks. Like, she could walk, but she couldn't, like, go on, a, like, even a five, ten minute walk. It was very, very bad. Constant heart failure. That's what it was. Just continual. And, um, she, this, this girl, our children's pastor, convinced her to, to come to the church to have uh, myself or Craig pray for her. And it was just this very casual, it was middle of the week, and she showed up one day, and I think I was, I was youth pastoring at the time, I think I was doing something for youth, and they walk into Craig's office, and they sit down, and he's just like, oh, hey, how you doing? And like, oh, we just want prayer, you know, for my heart, and explain the situation. And, and um, right then and there, she decides on the spot, she wants to invite Jesus into her life, so that was very cool. Uh, we were like, wow, that, that just happened. And, uh, and then he's like, okay, well, I'm just going to pray for your heart now and I think she had also fallen and something with her leg she couldn't I don't know there's a lot happening so he just reaches out very calm casual prayer releases the goodness of our father over her and then they leave and she said her leg felt a little better and they leave and uh, then we begin to get the reports how how much longer was it days of um she she waking up and she has energy and she can walk up and down the stairs and it, they don't know what's happening. And this is, this is like when you have a condition and it's been the same way for years and years and years and years, when it starts to change, it's hard to believe. You, you don't know what to, you don't know how to act differently because you're conditioned mentally to act a certain way. So even though your physical body might be saying something different, your mind says, no, don't do that. And it's very hard to rewire our mind. So she had such a hard time. Anyway, fast forward, she went to the doctor, got the report, 100% healed. 100%. I mean, radically changed her life so much so that, I mean, the nanny lost her job. So, (laughs) prayed her way out of a job. But (sighs) the Lord provides. It's all good. I, uh, this one's a little more, well, I mean, they're all out of the box, but this is, this might stretch you a little. Um, I had this really, really bad sore throat a couple years ago, and, um, I was just like in this continual season of just encountering the father and just, just being wrecked. I can barely talk right now as I even think about it. Um, just by him and in his presence. And there's just some wild things happening in my life and in his presence. And um, I had this really bad sore throat. So, like, like if you've ever had strep throat, like that where it's like feels like razor blades. And um, I, I went to bed and I was just like, this is really bad. Like, I, I, you know, I, I, obviously I can't go to the doctor, but I, Father, I just, I've been experiencing you. I'm just laying in my bed. I've been experiencing you. You've been, you know, moving in my life. And I just asking for a visitation for you to come and just heal me. And I had a visitation that night. And um, that verse, taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, I had, a, I had an angelic visitation that night where... Um, an angel of the Lord came in my room and offered me something. I, I know if this is stretching you, I just, in Jesus' name, Father, I just release just your truth. And I, I took what this angel offered me and I, I ate it, which I believe was the word because taste and see that the Lord is good. And there's also biblical evidence of where prophets ate scrolls and things like that. You can look it up. And, um, and then 
I, op- I felt the Holy Spirit say, open your mouth. So, and, and remember, my throat is killing me. Like, it is like razor blades. It is very, very bad. So I open my mouth, and I'm just laying in the dark, and Craig's sleeping way, you know, this is just, this is happening to me. I'm just like doing my own thing, you know, with Jesus and angels. And uh, just laying there with my mouth open, and I feel like an angelic hand go in my mouth and in my throat after I had consumed this thing, I don't know, and like almost like scratch out or take out the, the sickness. And like just kind of like that. And I was just laying there. I had my eyes closed. I should have opened them. It would have been interesting. Um, and the next thing I knew, this just happened for, just for a few moments. And then the, the feeling's gone, and I close my mouth, and I swallow, and I'm like instantly healed, 100%, no pain, never came back, nothing. Are you feeling encouraged? When we were in Mexico over this past summer, I don't know, I think many of you might have caught the story how one of our team members, Michelle, had the house fall on her. No, you missed that one? Oh, I mean, it wasn't one of the highlights we came back with, but we focused more on, you know, like the children and the good things that we did, not like, you know, almost killing one of our own. But, um, well, it was just one of those things that happens on a house build in another country. And um, the house fell on her shoulder and she literally fell on her shoulder. And it was very scary to watch this happen. And, but no one could make it in time and, and it hit her. And she had numbness from up here all the way down. It was bad. We were, so we just, you know, well, some people kept building the house and a couple of us went and prayed for her and the work must go on, right? And, uh, and we're praying for her. And she's, we, we ask in, in a little bit, like, how do you feel? And she's like, I feel good. I feel good. I feel good. Well, I'm telling you what, I mean, it, the, the numbness went away. The pain started to get, you know, a lot less. And she went on day after day. She felt better and better and better and better. I mean, come on. It, it could have been so bad. And God rushed in and healed one morning while we were there, Josiah and Kenzie were, were due to uh, lead some worship at this block party we're going to do with tons of this unreached kids. And this is one of the worst neighborhoods in the city that we were in. And um, I look at Josiah in the morning and he is white as a ghost. And I'm like, this isn't good. He's like, I don't feel good. Next thing I, I see, he's out. This is in Mexico. It's not very clean where we are. And he's laying on the ground. I mean, we need a prayer just for that. And, um, and he's laying on the ground and just, he's like, I, I, I'm not okay. He was so sick. And so some of the team members, you know, we just start praying over him. He bounces up, not much longer later after that. And he's 100% fine. And they were able to lead worship that night. You know, I could go on and on and on and on and on. And, and you know what? I could pass the microphone around to all of you. And then each of you could go on and on and on and on and on and on about the goodness of the Father and what he wants to do this morning. I'm going to ask the worship team to come um, just to just begin to play some worship. Uh, whoever is in here is fine to come. And, um, and we're going to release healing in this place this morning. So if you came with something, if you've been fighting something for years, if you've been contending in contention, Today is a day to switch to hope in your healing. Today is a day to see something change. See, when, when faith was a baby, God gave us a verse, and it was 1 Corinthians 2, 5, and it said this, and, and this is what God said for her life, to pray over her every day, and we have for 13 years. And it said, so that your faith doesn't rest on the wisdom of man, but on the power of God. so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of man. See, our faith in our healing, our hope for goodness of the Father to be released on our life, that wisdom, all those things, isn't found in this earth, but is found in the supernatural, overriding 
power of God. It doesn't matter how many years you've been fighting. It doesn't matter how many years you've been believing or contending because today is a new day. And today his mercies are new and they're available for you. Today all things are possible. Not yesterday, not tomorrow. I believe tomorrow. I believe that this week something's going to change. No, no, no. Today in this moment because hope is here today. And healing is here today. And healer is here today. And today could actually be your day that changes everything. Because this could be your after 12 years of bleeding, it stops. Your after 38 years, uh, Jesus provides the access point to walk again. You thought it was going to happen a different way. You wondered if it was going to be. He, this man wondered, I thought it was going to be in the pool, but Jesus is like, no, 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 no. I rule this healing school. It's not going to be in the pool today. It's going to be by my hand saying, take up your mat. Let's walk. And today I believe that he is here and Jesus is the access point to our healing because the Bible says that he is the door to the Father. So all we have to do to get into the Father's presence is to walk through Jesus into his presence. Jesus says to come to me, all who are weary, all who need rest, and I will give you that. He says to be in Jesus, in Jesus' name. That is an into position. That is not a lot of come alongside position. That is I am literally going to step into Jesus. And when I am in Jesus and Jesus is in me, I have access to all that Jesus has. What does Jesus have? Everything. He has all access to the Father because Him and the Father and the Holy Spirit are one. They are three in one. So anything you need from the Father, from Holy Spirit, or from Jesus, you have access to today because you are in His name and He is in you. Are you understanding me this morning? Let's stand. Jesus is your hope in your healing. Jesus is here for you today. Jesus is king over your situation. Jesus is king over your illness, over your situation, or your, over your, your over death that's been pronounced over you, over the hopelessness that you've felt in your life, over your mental condition and, and, and sickness that you've been battling with, over your fears and over your struggles. Jesus is your answer. Jesus is king. Jesus is truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I cannot overemphasize the name of Jesus. That he is access to everything you need and everything you could ever want. There is an invitation this morning for you and for me to encounter Jesus, to encounter the Father through the doorway of Jesus himself our access point I'm gonna release hope that's how we're gonna start right now we're gonna start with a release of hope because we've encouraged ourselves in our faith but now we need hope over our fears and over our disappointment and over our wonderings if it may or may not happen today because hope is happening today and healing is happening today so, Father, if you need hope to start this morning, I just want you just to reach out towards heaven, just to reach out, just some kind of acknowledgement that, yeah, 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 I need that, Father, from you. I need an encouragement of hope this morning. So right now, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus, I release a hope over your people, over your children, over every son and over every daughter that is in need of encouragement, that is in need of hope restored today where they have been deferred in their hope and they need the dream to come to fruition as hope is restored again. I release hope in this place and in our lives and in our minds and in our hearts in Jesus, in Jesus' name. Now go ahead and just receive your hope and pull it down in Jesus' name.